please be seated. And while you're getting seated, if you would, please turn to Numbers chapter 22 and look for verses 21 through 31. If you're using our Bible in the chair backs, the, uh, the page is 113. If you're using your Bible, Numbers is the fourth book of the Bible between Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And once you get to chapter 22, if you would put your thumb in uh, that spot, I want to talk to you guys today about a car. Hey, hey. All right. Well, buying a car anyway. Transportation for me has always been kind of a confusing, confusing thing, especially when it comes to buying a car, because to me it seems so permanent. You know, I mean, it's one of those, I, I, I keep cars for a long time. I've had the one I've had uh, now for about 10 years. I've got 208,000 miles on it. I love it. I'm going to run that thing into the ground, right? So I don't like going and buying cars. So if you're a car salesman in here, please don't approach me. I'm not going to buy a car. We're just talking about cars here. But when I buy cars, you've, you've heard me before. I'm, I'm big on names. I'm big on definitions. So when a company names a car, I'm going to look at what they name the car. And I'm going to go, okay, is that or could that car be what it says it is? And to confuse me even more, car companies will start putting numbers on there. And it seems like the higher the number, the, the greater the car, right? I mean, Mazda has the 323 three, and the 626 six, and the 929, nine, right? But Pontiac said, Psh, we got 1,000. But the Audi said, we got 3,000, 4,000, 5,000. So Pontiac said, eh, we got 6,000. Saab jumps in. They go, we got 9,000. Nissan cut it all. They said, all right, top this, infinity. <laughs> well, I'm now I'm not going to get a car that has a number on it. You know, so I'm looking elsewhere. Now Chrysler and Mitsubishi have come together and, and confused me even more because they've come out with the Vision, the Eclipse, and the Mirage. So I'm sitting there looking at it going, this is confusing because a vision is something you should be looking at. A eclipse is something you shouldn't be looking at. And a mirage is something you're really not looking at, you know. <laughs> but then I look at the cars and I think, okay, are the car companies telling me where they want me to live? Because there's cars out there that fit for anybody who live in the big city all the way out to the boondocks. If you live in the inner city, they got what? The metro. A little further out, they've got the suburban. For the posh people, they have the town car. <laughs> For people who are confused and don't know where they want to live, they have the town and country, you know. <laughs> A little further out, they have the villager, you know. Further out beyond civilization, they've got the Yukon and the Outback. And for those who have to go farther, well, there's Mercury and Saturn. You can't get any further than that. But what happens now, I'm looking at, what if I want to uh, buy a car that actually can do what it sounds like it can do? Like if we go on a trip somewhere and there's no roads, we would need a pathfinder or a trailblazer. Or maybe we go on a trip somewhere that uh, no one has ever gone before, we would need to get a discovery or an explorer. And if we get lonely along the way, we'd either bring an amigo or a sidekick along, right? So. <laughs> but now I'm thinking, well... What kind of trip do I want it to be? You know, now i got to get a car that, that, that helps me with the trip I want it to be. Do I want it to be a quick trip? Well, I'll get a sprint. If I want it to be a long trip, we'll get a journey. A hopeful trip, we'll get a quest. If we want to be a long, gone for a long time, <laughs> we'll get an odyssey. You know? But now there's cars out there with names that actually fit the mood that I'm in. Now, I mean, if I want to be daring, I'll get an intrepid. If I want to be a gentleman... I'll get a galant. If I want to go overseas, I'll get a passport. You know, if I can't concentrate, I'll get a focus. You know, <laughs> if my batteries are down, I'll get a charger. You know, if I want to go really fast, I'll get a turbo. If I got medical problems, I'll get a probe. <laughs> and if I ever have a bad relationship, I'll get an escape. So, <laughs> but. Seriously, an escape is actually something that a man named Balaam really needed, but instead, he got the right of his life. So that's where we're going to go when we go to Numbers chapter 22. But first, a little backstory on Balaam and who Balaam was. Because Balaam, we're about to learn that Balaam took a trip that he should not have gone down. He should not have taken it at all. See, Balaam was from Mesopotamia. Who knows where Mesopotamia is? One. I got it. Two, three. Awesome. College students do not count. All right, um, and people in the first and second service who do not count. Uh, Mesopotamia is modern-day Iraq, and that is, that is where he was from. 
And he was known in that area for two things. He was known for being dead on right for every prophetic word he ever uttered, including um, the, the effectiveness of curses that he put on people. And he was known for an insatiable lust for money and riches. Those were the two things that he was, he was known for. Now, the Israelites, they had not been too far into the journey. Um, they had just left Mount Sinai. They'd been there for two years, and they, they, they went out, and they started walking through kingdoms. Well, they went through two kingdoms uh, prior to going to around Moab, and they just knocked on the king's door and said, Hey, um, we're just passing through. We would just like pay safe passage. Would you give us safe passage? And each king said, absolutely not. And not only did they not let them have safe passage, but they took up their people and they attacked the Israelites. Not a good thing to do when God's on your side because both kingdoms fell when they attacked the Israelites. So now the king of Moab is freaking out right now because he's seen it. His neighbors have fallen to these people. He does not want to be the next kingdom that falls. So what does he do? Instead of talking to these people, instead of attacking these people, he calls on Balaam, a well-known prophet who has, uh, who's very effective at, at cursing people and those curses sticking. You see, God told Balaam, absolutely not. You are not to go see the king of Moab, and you are not to curse these people because you will not curse what I have blessed. Well, after some... Some insisting that he at least hear them out. God says, okay, you can go. But only say what I say that you can say. But the fact that Balaam actually got up and went is what made God very angry. And that is where we pick up in chapter 22. So if you would, unthumb your, unthumb your Bible. And we're going to read from chapter, uh, chapter 22, verses 21 through 31. Here we go. Balaam got up in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. But God was very angry when he went, and the angel of the Lord stood in the road to oppose him. Balaam was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with a drawn sword in his hand, she turned off the road into a field. Balaam beat her to get back onto the road. Then the angel of the Lord stood in a narrow path between two vineyards with walls on both sides. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she pressed close to the wall, crushing Balaam's foot against it. So he beat her again. Then the angel of the Lord moved ahead and stood in a narrow place where there was no room to turn, either to the right or to the left. When the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, she lay down under Balaam, and he was angry and beat her with his staff. Then the Lord opened the donkey's mouth, and she said to Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? Balaam answered the donkey, You have made a fool of me. If I had a sword in my hand, I would kill you right now. The donkey said to Balaam, Am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden to this day? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? No, he said. Then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. Now, lesson number one here, I think, is probably the most obvious to us. It's, it's basically this. If I don't have godly vision then I cannot see God. Now, that's, that's a basic lesson, I think, to, to pull from this. I know, but look at the evidence here. A man who was not one of God's chosen people, he was not from the tribes of Israel. Remember, we said he was from Mesopotamia. Uh, he had several conversations with God. And, and these two times are not the only times that he spoke with God. He's spoken to him several times before. A man who has not one of God's people, who spoke with God several times before, couldn't see him, but his donkey could. He could speak to him, but he couldn't see him. That's kind of an amazing and a powerful note here is that, one, you don't have to be a Christian to speak to God. You don't have to be one of his chosen people to speak to God. Well, how do we know this? Well, what do we know about Balaam? I think the first thing we need to remember here is that Balaam, like I said, he's not from one of the tribes of Israel. So how is it that someone who's not of God's chosen people is able to speak to God? I think that answer is simple. It is because God is sovereign over all. He is the creator. Everything his creation, he is sovereign over that and including Balaam. And this alone should be proof enough that God does not only speak to his children, but he speaks to everyone else. 
Now, for us today, if you think about it, people are everywhere. And they're always crying out to him. Whether they believe in him or not, I've got atheist friends who have called out to God when they were scared. You know, a little bit later on, we had a good laugh about that because I was like, you realized you called out to, in your mind, nobody, right? And to that, they said, shut up. <laughs> well, you know, it's just, just proving the point. Well, I think that is because all God's creation is calling out to God because God is calling out to all his creation, whether they think about it or not. But you see, people, we, we answer differently. Some people, we answer God. Some people, we reject him. Some people, they ignore God. Some people get angry. And some people, like Balaam, uh, he could hear God, had a conversation with God, but he didn't really listen to God. Didn't listen to him at all because Balaam is what you would call a false prophet. Now, he's not a false prophet because everything he said was wrong or one thing he said was wrong. On the contrary, remember I said, everything he said was right. Everything he said happened, especially curses. If, if he cursed you, it worked. And that's one of the reasons why the king of Moab wanted an audience with him. So what, what's a false prophet? Why was he a false prophet? Well, his heart was not moved by God. Remember, he had this, this lust for money and, and lust for riches, and that's pretty much all he could see. So forget the fact that he was talking to the creator of all. Of all. He just wanted the gold. He wanted silver. He wanted diamonds. He wanted all these things. And, and he, he was willing to push God to get it. He was not moved by God. He was moved by earthly things. And that's one of the reasons he was a, why he was a false prophet. Now, for pe people who live like Balaam lived, the apostle Peter says this in one of his letters. He says, they have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of Balaam, son of Beor, who loved the wages of wickedness. And a little bit further on in, into the uh, New Testament, Jude, uh, the second to the last book of the Bible, Jude warns us against those who rush into profit through Balaam's error. So what was Balaam's error? Well, he, one, he didn't have a vision of who God was. He could hear him but he couldn't see him. His donkey could. So if he had no vision of God and who he was, that's the reason why Balaam went down the road that he did. He continued on that road, and God did not want him to do it, but yet God allowed him to do that. So the, how does that apply to me thousands and thousands of years later? Well, I think sometimes we have an agenda that basically serves nobody but ourselves. We have specific things and specific wants that we are willing to put our focus on completely, taking our eyes off of God. And that's not how we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to focus on God completely, and we will have our needs provided. But sometimes we do that. Sometimes we push him to allow us to do what we want. Balaam wanted riches, but in order to do that, what did he have to do? Balaam had to curse the children of Israel, and God said, no. You are not going to curse what I have blessed. So God sent his angel to, to block his path. And that leads us to the second lesson here. Our second lesson is if I go outside of God's will, he will seek to correct me. If I go out of his will, he will seek to correct me. Now, if, if, we're, if we're children of God, what does that make God? Our parent, right? Right? What happens when a child steps out of line? What happens when a child or your teenager or your college kid is just continually, sorry, college kids, if your college kid is just continually just pushing your buttons or just pushing the envelope with you? Better yet, husbands, how many of y'all have ever had a conversation with your wife like this? Sweetheart, I know that you want me to go with your family this week into the social thing that you've been planning for six months, this Saturday. But I really want to watch the big game. Can I do that instead? Please. <laughs> pretty please. You're so pretty. <laughs> hey, baby. And you finally, you just persist. You know, and you keep going, and finally your wife just look at you, looks at you and goes, okay, that's fine. 
And somewhere in your mind, you're going, <laughs> I know that tone, but you watch the game anyway. Well, guess what? We do that to God a lot. Well, see, that's what Balaam, and that's what Balaam did with God. Balaam wanted the money. Balaam wanted the money. They came to him and said, you know, come do this. And he said, hold on, let me go check with God. And God said, no, you're not going to do that. And he persisted. Please, can I just hear them out? Can I just talk to them? And God went, okay, that's fine. But only say what I allow you to say. Well, see, Balaam should have stopped right there. Big red flag should have been going, no, no, don't, no, no, don't do that. But he went. He went anyway, and God got angry. Why? Because it was God's perfect will that he trust him. It was his will that Balaam would trust God and not go, but instead he went. Why? Because Balaam was a severely double-minded man. So what happened? The angel of the Lord stood in front of Balaam, blocking the path, and the only one who can see the angel was the donkey. And God's trying to get Balaam's attention. The only one who can see him is, is the donkey, and, and he had no clue that he was being blocked because he was intent on getting to the king of Moab so he can at least talk to him and view some of those jewels and view some of that silver and gold. Had no clue that there was an unhappy angel standing there with a big sword. Have you ever, ever, ever tried to wrangle a toddler? Some of you parents know exactly what I'm talking about. That two-year-old, three-year-old kid just wants something. They see something, and they just go after it. And what do you do as the parent? Maybe they're going after something, but they don't see this flight of stairs that, uh, that's there. They just see the, 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 the boppy or the whatever it is that they want to, uh, to go for. And they go for it, and you, being the good parent, block them. Stop. Don't. Uh, what, what are you doing? And the kid can't see. He's not paying attention to you. He's doing this thing, trying to get to the right, to the left, trying to get under your legs and all that other stuff, trying to get away from you. Well, what happens when that toddler doesn't get what they want? That little awesome body just stiffens up and they go, ah! <laughs> they get mad. It's funny because here you are protecting them from, you know, <laughs> a, a world of hurt and all they see is the teddy bear or the candy or whatever it is that they want on the other side. Have you ever had that toddler get angry and not even have eye contact with you like you just didn't exist? You're just some nuisance in their way of what they want. Well, what if God is blocking us sometimes from the things that we want? Because I guarantee you there's some people in here and there's people that you know that are frustrated because they're just stuck. We're trying to get what we want, but for some reason, our plan is not working, and we don't know why we're getting blocked, but we are just angry, and we lash out at everything that we can. But what if God is blocking us because he doesn't want us to have what we think we want because he has something better for us? Knowing full well if we get what we want, we may end up hurting ourselves or others in the process. Now, what happens when the parent is done trying to block the toddler. The atmosphere in the room changes. Mommy becomes mother. And the whole world of that child turns suddenly different. Well, in the same way, guess what? God does the same to us. And that brings us to our next lesson here is that if I cannot see God's correction, then he will get my attention. How did he get Balaam's attention? Well, the first way he got Balaam's attention is he opened the donkey's mouth and she began to speak. Stop. Why in the world is there no evidence at all of Balaam freaking out that his donkey that he's had for a, I don't know how long started to have a conversation with him? I'm thinking it should have been something like, why are you beating me? And Balaam said, say what? <laughs> but no, he, he went in with it. He, not only was he not shocked, he had a conversation with a donkey. 
and it didn't it didn't phase him at all. It was you know I'm sitting here, I'm reading this, I'm amazed. The, the conversations, Balaam, why are you hitting me? Why are you beating me? Because you made me look like a jack. <laughs> Fool. Sorry about that. But that didn't happen. He just went with it, you know. So back to the talking donkey. God got Balaam's attention. He opened the donkey's mouth, and after a conversation with a donkey, he still wasn't persuaded to turn around. So what did God do then? He opened Balaam's eyes, and Balaam saw this angel of the Lord standing there with a sword. And finally, Balaam, once again, who was not an Israelite, who was not chosen, he wasn't of the chosen people, he was not a Christian, humbled himself in front of the angel of the Lord. Why? You don't have to be a child of God to humble yourself before God. The Bible is very specific that every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess. That's exactly what happened. Balaam repented. He got on his face and he started repenting. Think of the most ungodly person you know. Think of the most ungodly person you have ever read about in history and they, their knees will hit the floor and their tongue will confess that he is Lord just as fast as you, a willing servant, will one day. And for some, that's already happened. But see, how does this apply to me, Chad? I mean, I don't have a talking donkey to help me see God. Well, true. But let's put, look past the miracle of the speaking donkey for a second. Let's, let's look past that for a second. What did the donkey do when she saw the angel of the Lord? She avoided it. She avoided danger. Well, what did the donkey do when she can go no further? Well, she, she laid down under Balaam. See, for us, I think if we humble ourselves like the donkey did, then perhaps we won't get angry when things don't go the way that we want them to go. All right, Chad, hold on a second. The donkey didn't humble herself. You telling me that a donkey? Well, she, she spoke, so I'm pretty sure the donkey can do whatever she wants. You tell me that the donkey humbled herself. She just, she just laid down because she couldn't go any further. Well, yeah. What should we do when we can't go any further? What should we do when we're frustrated and we're stuck and we can't go any further? We can't go right, we can't go left, we can't turn back. What should we do? We should humble ourselves before God and cry out to him and repent. In truth, we should do that every day. We should do that absolutely every, every day so that we may find ourselves with God instead of in situations without God. But how, if you are, however, if you are at a point in your life right now that you need to humble yourself, I would say do it. Don't stand one more day stuck. Don't sit one more day in frustration. Humble yourself. Ask God for vision. Ask God for direction and do not go down the path of Balaam. See, for Balaam, again, all he can see was money. All he can see was riches. That's what he wanted. He kept pushing God so that he can get a reward from man. And if he would have just saw God, he would have seen that the reward that God had for him was much greater than any man could ever give. I want to encourage each of you to read this story from beginning to end. It's, I mean, it's four chapters, chapters 21 through 25 in Numbers. It's a wonderful story. It's got a lot of wisdom that will open your eyes. Because there's a lot of things in there that, you know, are, <laughs> it's really cool. Uh, and I'll get to that in a second. Final lesson today. I'll let you fill in the blank on this one. If God can use a donkey, then he can use blank. You can choose to put your name in there. You can choose to put the word me in there. Heck, if you don't like what you're hearing, you can put my name. I don't care. It would be an honor. But see, people say that a lot. If God can use a donkey, he can use me. <laughs> but do we re re you really believe that? It's true. God did use a donkey. Believe it or not, God is using you. He uses you every single day. 
But let's, let's, look at the, let's, just, let's look at the attributes of this donkey and how you can apply them to your life. Because she was really the hero in this whole story. In this scenario, she was the hero. What did she do when, you know, one, she saw the angel of the Lord when her master couldn't. Two, she was a friend to Balaam. What happened when she saw the, when she saw the, uh, the angel, the unhappy one with a sword about to swing and kill her master? She avoided him. And when she couldn't go any further, she took a beating for him three times. She was a hero, and, and she spoke to him. After that, she said, hey, haven't I been this donkey that you've been riding all these years? Haven't I done this for you? Have I ever done this to you at all? She said, and he said, no. The story, I think, would have been a little bit different had he been abusive all this time. If he beat her all the time, I think the story would have read something like this. And the angel of the Lord was standing there with a sword about to kill Balaam. The donkey looked up, saw the angel, said, sweet, and walked straight into the angel. But she didn't. She obeyed. She was obedient because when, when God said, speak, she spoke. Go back to that long list of cars I gave you at the beginning of the service, all right? We all get to choose what vehicle that we drive, regardless of whether it's out of, you know, convenience, affordability, reliability. The list goes on forever. And I, I want to challenge you here to think about this. You are a vehicle. If you are a Christian, you have Christ as your Savior. That means you have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit in you. You are a vehicle that takes the Holy Spirit everywhere. That means whatever you're doing, the Spirit is there. Whatever you say, the Spirit is there. Whatever you're watching, whatever you're downloading, the Spirit is there. We need to understand that God can, has, and will use us and the things that are surrounding us to get his point across because he has dominion over everything. If you read a little bit further in the chapter 24, you will see God use Balaam. Once again, someone who was not his child, someone who was not in the family, someone who was not, if you put it in modern day terms, a Christian. And this man outside of the family prophesied about King David thousands of years later. You'll read it in the last half of chapter 24. He says, I see him, but not now. I see a star rising from Jacob. I see a scepter. I see a ruler, and he will have dominion. And he, he just reads it out, and guess what? Judgment came to the Moabites at that point. Because like I said, God will not let anybody curse anything that God has blessed. And the Moabites met their judgment when King David became king. Now, how do I humble myself? How do I do like the donkey did? Well, you might be thinking, Man, I don't know how to humble myself. And that's fine. You, know, you, don't, you don't have to know how to do it. You just need, you need to do it. Balaam didn't have a choice. There was no physical, mental, or spiritual uh, way that he could resist not getting on his face and not repenting because when it was revealed who was standing in front of him, that's all he could do. You see, we need to get to a point where we're doing it every day. So my advice for you is to humble yourself. Ask yourself a question. Ask yourself this question. What is a position of humility? It's a position of surrender. What is a position of surrender? Put your hands up, folks. You're under arrest. Ever wonder why people put their hands up in church? It's not, the, not so they can be seen, not so they can prove to the person next to them, yes, I'm sure. But they're surrendering. They're praising. Get on your knees. Get on your face before God and repent. You could do that in your bedroom today when you get home. Don't do it on the bed. The bed is for resting. The bed is for sleeping. Get on your floor. Make it a position of humility. Humble yourself and cry out to God. If you don't know how to cry out to God, start with something like, Dear God, I can't do this. I need your strength. 
I am weak. You are strong. I am, I am nothing. You are awesome. Thank you for the love that you give me. Thank you for the life you've given me. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for guiding me. Because I don't want to do this life anymore to where I have to rely on my own choices, my own wisdom. I can't do this without you. And if you start with something like that, I would say that's a good start.